Hello, BookTube. I have today uh, a supplementary video of a kind. It's the very last supplementary video that any of you were ever asking for. It's the second comic book video in the week. <laughs> On Wednesdays, I do Epic Comic Book Wednesdays with Michael K. Vaughn, where we talk about a shared comic book. And we're not comic book dude bros. There's a whole sub-genre of YouTube that are comic book dude bros. We're not laying claim to the subject of comic books. It's, it's hardly in our little corner of booktube, hardly anybody talks about them. Uh, so, you know, when I saw Michael K. Vaughn was doing it, I jumped on it. Uh, and I did the same thing just recently with Roy Reed's Anything. He was reading his way through an old issue from the 1970s with Superman Family. I jumped right in. In fact, I'm not done with that. I'm going to do, now that he's done with it, I'm going to do a, a finish up that issue myself. Uh, and recently, I saw David Wiley hold up a comic book, an era, a run, and talk about it. And I immediately wanted to jump right in. <laughs> I love this stuff. I love talking about it. So I went through the whole rigmarole. I emailed Michael K. Vaughn, make sure that he's okay with it. Uh, he's never read this run, so he was perfectly okay with it. I emailed David Wiley and made sure that he's okay with it. Do you know how temperamental he gets? <laughs> uh, and it's the, the run is this. It's the Astonishing X-Men, uh, which, which dovetails with the last thing that Michael K. Vaughn and I talked about on Epic Comic Book Wednesday. We talked about a Captain America run that has the same artist, uh, John Cassidy. Only here he's doing the X-Men with writing by Joss Whedon of Buffy the Vampire Slayer and the Avengers fame and whatnot. Uh, and this is a very particular era of the X-Men that's in, important to understand. Professor X is off the scene. Uh, and so is Jean Grey. Marvel Girl is dead in the X-Men. I do not understand that. I have never understood that decision. I, I agree completely uh, with a, a writer from a long time ago when the X-Men were relaunched who said that Professor X and Jean Grey and Scott Summers, Cyclops, are the heart and soul of the X-Men. Cut out the heart and the body dies. Those three, not, not one of them should be dead and not one of them should be a supervillain either, but that's a rant for another time. Uh, but Jean Grey is dead and Scott Summers has fallen in love with Emma Frost, who is a supervillainess. She's the white queen of the Hellfire Club. We, when we meet her, she is a villain. She has a knockdown, drag out, psychic fight. She's a telepath. She has a psychic fight with... Uh, with Jean Grey, with Marvel Girl, and loses. Uh, another editorial decision of long-standing now, this has been going on for decades, that I don't agree with. Emma Frost is one of the least convincing villain changes of heart that I've ever seen. And the writers have usually just uh, gotten around that by making her a villain. They just A villain who happens to be on the X-Men instead of fighting them. Uh, not a likable character at all, but she is a stalwart part of the team here. Uh, and this is needless to say, this is before all of the horrible things that have been done to the X-Men in the last seven years. So Scott Summers, Cyclops, the leader of the X-Men is a hero. He's a good guy. He was made to be, he was raised to be a good guy by Professor X. So, uh, none of that is true here. And also another element that takes place before the, this, this comic book run was an element in which there was a particular plague that was affecting only mutants. It was a mutant kind of AIDS, and mutants were dying of it. And in that storyline, the climax of that storyline, which took place uh, years and years before this came out, the armored X-Men Colossus dies in that storyline and has been gone for a long time. He and Kitty Pride, of course, if you, if you know anything about this era of the X-Men, you know that they were sweet on each other. Uh, and that ended in tragedy and briefly sent Kitty Pride into a kind of gritty 90s realization of her of her character uh her ability for those of you who don't know the x-men is the ability to phase into instantial insubstantiality so she can phase through walls phase through floors that sort of thing and she can take things with her she can she can grab onto something and phase it through solid matter as well uh which is a, a an ability that of course that that ability is is uh the same one is enjoyed by Phantom Girl, the Legion of Superheroes. Whether or not Phantom Girl can phase anything else with her is on again, off again, depending on what writer is writing her. But Kitty Pride can definitely do that. Uh, and she has a, a pet dragon, 
Lockheed, who's also from that time period of the X-Men. Beloved creation of Chris Claremont, so she's she's in this team. This was a team that, that Joss Whedon sort of constructed for the purposes of these issues. I wonder if I have a whole picture of them. Yeah, yeah, I do. There's the, a picture of the core team. There is Emma Frost. There is Wolverine. Of course, you can't do an X-Men comic without Wolverine. There's Cyclops. In one of his last great turns as a, a full-blooded hero, there's Kitty Pride. And you might be wondering, what's that? That's Hank McCoy, the Beast, another original member of the X-Men, same as, as Scott Summers. Only <laughs> when when the Beast first premiered in X-Men number one, he was a gorilla-like human. That was his mutant. His, his mutation was that he had amazing strength, amazing agility, and that his arms were as long and as thick as, thick as his legs. He was kind of... Uh, an ape-like, gorilla-like. He, so he, his code name is Beast. And then, years and years and years later, he was experimenting on himself. Those of you who have seen the X-Men movies where Nick, Nicky Holt plays Hank McCoy will know a variation of this. He's experimenting on himself when he accidentally triggers a secondary mutation that causes him to sprout blue fur all over his body and maybe increases his agility and his strength. Probably increases his strength. Uh... And in this series, Joss Whedon introduces the concept of a secondary mutation. That mutants can have a second, so they have a, a mutation for 20 years, and then it keeps changing on them, which is certainly not how this works, but we, we left that behind with X-Men number one, so we don't have to worry about how actual mutations work. And in Hank McCoy's secondary mutation in Astonishing X-Men, let me get you a good uh, close-up. In his secondary mutation, he's a big kitty cat. Uh, <laughs> I do not... <laughs> anyway, that's our core team. Uh, they are living at Xavier School for Gifted Youngsters. They, are, they have a, a whole roster of students. And uh, Joss Whedon has a big story to tell here. In in that's collected in this it came out individually in, in issues. It's collected in this volume and in the subsequent volume. And I want to stress here before we move on to that story, David Wiley's video. I'll leave a link to his video down below. His video was very considerate about spoilers. I am not going to be. So if you have never read this and you're worried about spoilers to a 30 year old comic, then definitely don't watch this video. Uh, because it's going to be chalked to your eyeballs with spoilers, <laughs> absolutely. I'm going to take you through some panels of this thing, because the the panels of this thing, the rereading of this, I reread it when I saw when I saw David's video. Uh, it really underscores the strengths and weaknesses of Joss Whedon as a writer, which you may have encountered if you've seen his work, maybe not read his work, but seen his work. It's definitely it definitely comes out in the TV shows or the movies or whatnot, whatever he's had his hands in. Uh, it's the same as on the printed page. He has uh, two weaknesses and two strengths. The, the two weaknesses are he's terrible at plot. And boy, oh boy, can you tell in this. These two volumes together are supposed to be one plot <laughs> about, about a place called Breakworld and its monstrous leader and his vendetta against all mutants. But, oh my God, does the plot wander <laughs> to the point where I don't think, I just reread these, I don't think I could synopsize it. It's, it's a weakness of, of Whedon. He likes to, to plot everything in the, and the kitchen sink in there and try to hold all these plates in the air. It doesn't work, and no one's ever bothered to really tell him that it doesn't work, so he just keeps doing it. Uh, that's weakness number one. Weakness number two of his is closely allied to one of his strengths, which is that sometimes his quips... His, his uh, jokes fall flat, usually when they involve bodily functions. Uh, Rereading these two volumes back to back all in one sitting, I was really uncomfortably aware of how often P is mentioned. Uh, it shouldn't be. Joss Whedon is a grown man, so it, it may be once if it's a really good joke, but not repeatedly. Uh, and his two strengths are uh, one is small and one is large. So small strength is that he's really good at characters. Really, really good at them. There, there's no such thing in a Joss Whedon production as interchangeable characters. The main, his main characters are always wonderfully distinct from each other. Those of you who remember Buffy the Vampire Slayer, for instance, or Angel, will know that, or Firefly, you will, you will know that. And his big strength 
is moments. Uh, when he is crafting a big plot and when he is moving it all along and all of its different plates and all of its different parts and when he's keeping all of his characters in character, every once in a while he has a flawless instinct for where to swerve just a little to give you a beautiful, beautiful moment. A moment that just makes you want to sit up and cheer. Not necessarily because it's a happy moment, but because it's a perfectly realized moment, just perfectly done. Uh, that's a strength of his. And he, that strength is often seen, it's seen at its strongest in moments that Whedon doesn't always get a chance to to do, which is endings. He's terrific at endings. Just terrific at them. Think about, for instance, uh, I mean, he wasn't maybe not doing the day-to-day -day writing chores, but definitely overseeing, for instance, something like Buffy the Vampire Slayer. School's out for bloody summer. Who can forget the ending of Buffy the Vampire Slayer? It's perfectly done. Same thing with Angel. Dibs on the dragon. No one can forget that. Same, but with something like, for instance, the Justice League, uh, you can't. You're, you're called in to brush up things, but you're not called in, or the Avengers, you're not called in to end anything. And with Astonishing X-Men, well, of course, you're not going to kill Wolverine, right? You're, there's only so much that he can do in the way of endings here. And we're going to see he does as much as he possibly can. Because on this team, Scott Summers might be in love with, uh, with Emma Frost, but the others all remember when she was a villain. In fact, Kitty Pride points out in these issues that her introduction to the X-Men team, back when, uh, got a little bit of a visual callback here, back when she looked like that. <laughs> uh, Paul Smith artwork there, sitting right alongside John Cassidy's. Uh, she recalls in one of these issues that her introduction to the X-Men was them being kidnapped and almost killed by Emma Frost. So it's impossible for her to think that Emma Frost is reformed. She just doesn't buy it. There's, they have a, uh, a wonderful exchange, actually, that uh, Whedon is really good at wonderful exchanges. The X-Men fights the leader of Breakworld, uh, and then when they're done, they have a long conversation, you know, between, amongst themselves. Uh, but Kitty Pride is not fooled. When, she, when it comes time for her to talk to Emma Frost on her own, she's, she is not warm and cuddly. Uh, Emma Frost says, I don't have a family famous for moral fiber. I like to think I've evolved, but I wanted someone on the team that I hadn't really fought alongside. Someone who would be inclined to watch me if I... And then she hesitates, and there's a blank panel where they're just looking at each other. Uh, and then Kitty Pride says, the first time I ever met the X-Men, the first day, they were ambushed, captured, and caged by you. I learned more about good and evil in that one day than I ever have before or since. I was 13. When I think about evil, whenever I think about the concept of evil, yours is the face that I see. I don't have to watch you, Miss Frost. I can smell you. And she says it as she's phasing through the wall uh, and leaving Emma Frost alone. Moments like that are wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. And uh, Wheaton gives us a bunch. For instance, at one point, uh, the, the mansion is attacked by a sentry. These giant there's Lockheed the Dragon. These giant uh, mutant hunting robots. Uh, and things are going poorly. Our team is getting uh, knocked on its keister. Uh, and at one point, Wolverine uh, wants to attack the computer's mainframe. He wants to dig inside the sentry and cut off its mainframe. And Scott Summers, Cyclops, says, there isn't time. I want this thing off my lawn. And the next panel that we get is all red. <laughs> it's just his optic blast at a full level intensity that we never see. Perfect artwork on Cassidy's part. Just our figures and all red, nothing else. And then just a blown away landscape. There they are, right down there. The, the, the shattered remains of the century. And because it's Joss Whedon, Wolverine gets a great line. Every now and then, Summers, I remember why you're still in charge. <laughs> that, is, that is awesome stuff. But eventually, the the, uh, the fight takes our heroes to Breakworld. And uh, th when they get there, uh, there's a huge discovery in store. <laughs> there's a, a huge discovery in store. I want to get you to the exact moment here. 
uh, because it is exactly what I'm talking about. It is what you get in a Joss Whedon production if he's given any degree of creative freedom. You get a great, you get great moments, fantastic moments. Kitty Pride is being fought. She's being shot at by these guards. The bullets go through her, of course, because she's phasing, and they hit something, a metal sound. And then the panel opens up, and it's Colossus, alive, behind her. And this, the next that follows, Whedon had to have directed Cassidy as to how to, how to draw this, because it is the visual representation of a perfect Joss Whedon moment, only without any words. She looks at him. She's stunned. He runs through her to attack her attackers, and she's still just standing there. She simply cannot believe what she's seeing, that her old boyfriend, her long-lost comrade, is alive. Uh, that is a classic, great Joss Whedon moment. Uh, and the, the plot continues and continues and continues. It goes to Breakworld and off. It involves a long and fairly unsuccessful uh, storyline about a mutant cure. A well-meaning geneticist comes up with a cure for the mutant condition, and the X-Men are split right down the middle as to uh, what they should do about it. There's a couple of other great Cyclops moments. Uh, but eventually... There's a lot of falter all about the rulership of Breakworld and, you know, the, the super weapon that the leader of Breakworld has developed in order to fire it at the world and kill everything. And it's, it's basically a gigantic bullet. It, huge, like a world size or an asteroid size bullet uh, that's mechanically guided and whatnot. And uh, there's almost no way that this will work. There's almost no way that it will that any, anyone can do anything about it. And Kitty Pride phases into that bullet. She phases into that weapon, but it's screwing with her ability to phase. She's not sure that she can phase out anymore. But she's riding the thing. When we get one of the most heart-touching issues of the X-Men that's ever been done, Josh Whedon takes us to Manhattan. He takes us to all of the heroes, the Fantastic Four, the other X-Men, Spider-Man, takes us to all of these heroes we're trying to figure out what to do about the fact that this gigantic weapon is headed to Earth. But Kitty Pride is inside it. She can't leave it. And uh, the heroes try, but there's nothing that they can do. Uh, and there's even a really weird uh, moment where they think they have succeeded. But actually, they're, it's fooling them. They, they're all just, see the drool? They're all just brainwashed. They think that they've succeeded. Spider-Man even briefly thinks, here, let me show you. Uh, he briefly thinks that he has caught the thing, this missile, in webbing. <laughs> Which certainly would not happen. Let me see if I can get that. Uh, yeah. He thinks he's caught the thing in webbing. Until they all start to wake up and realize that that absolutely cannot be true. Spider-Man actually says to Storm, uh, you saved the world, right? You stopped a 10-mile meteor with a great big breeze. Am I close? Uh, and she says, I, but I, I saved. And he said, yeah, so did they. And they're all drooling. They all think that they've done it, but they haven't. There's only one person who can save the world. And that's Kitty Pride, who's inside this device and can't get out of it. But although she can't phase out of it, she's pretty sure that she can phase it to insubstantiality. That she can make it a phantom so that it goes straight through its target. But it'll mean she can't get out. Uh, and she knows that. And she's resigned to that plan. Those of you who know, who, who watched Buffy the Vampire Slayer will remember this kind of a moment really well. And she's in mental communication with Emma Frost, who she doesn't trust at all. And Emma Frost says, Kitty, I can put you somewhere else. I can make you less afraid. Telepathy, in other words. And Kitty says, nah, nah, I'm going to see this through. Peter, that's Colossus, should know, well, he should already know, so don't worry about it. Uh, this was never meant to, not you. Yeah, I was supposed to take you out, as I recall. Disappointed, Ms. Frost? And Emma Frost sends back, astonished, Ms. Pride. Incredible that in that moment they respect each other. In that moment they come to some sort of... Uh, understanding of each other and then oh, look at this Cassidy artwork it works she phases the whole thing straight through the planet earth 
just incredible. And she's still alive inside the thing, but she can't stop phasing it, or it could hit something else. So she just has to go. She just she just has to stay on this this weapon forever. There's no way that anyone on Earth can think of to save her. We wait all the way until the end of the final issue to get the title. Gone. Just amazing. Just amazingly done. Uh, and <laughs> it really works. It really does. For X-Men material, it works really well. I want to show you one last slightly not PG uh, moment. I wonder if I can quickly find it. Uh, it's probably not in the second volume. Oh, no, it is in the second volume. Uh, it's really well done. Uh, it's it's a little bit on the risque side. But in this in these issues, Kitty Pride and Colossus uh, consummate their relationship. And there's this great moment where they come downstairs, they find Wolverine at the table, and he looks at both of them and says, about time. And this is anything else. He doesn't need to say anything else. They just awkwardly start to make breakfast. <laughs> it's a really neat moment. But this thing is full of really, really neat moments. There's a fantastic Cyclops moment uh, where he surprises the supervillain and then says, to me, my X-Men, which is something the old Professor X used to say all the time in X-Men. Uh, in other words, obviously, as you can tell from my tone of voice, these were a joy to reread. They were absolutely a joy to revisit. They have all of Joss Whedon's weaknesses, but they have lots and lots of his strengths as well. I don't agree with uh, Hank McCoy as the beast who is a big kitty cat. Uh, but I was very happy to see in Volume 1 when Hank McCoy is seriously considering taking the cure for his mutation. He's worried that, he, that his secondary mutations are eventually going to make him... Uh, a big a big little a big cat with no with no brain at all uh and when wolverine of course is dead set against this kind of cure uh, as, as a moral barometer he's dead set against it and uh they fight and i have always i have always appreciated wolverine x wolverine beast fights there have been a handful of them that aren't all one-sided wolverine has super senses he's extra sense of smell extra sense of hearing so does the beast Wolverine has an accelerated healing factor. So does the Beast. Wolverine has extremely sharp and deadly claws. So does the Beast. Uh, but the Beast can also lift two or three tons. Wolverine can't do that. The Beast is ten times as fast as he is. Uh, Wolverine isn't. He's he's Aside from his heightened senses and his healing factor, he's a normal guy with unbreakable knives on his knuckles. So that fight shouldn't be all one-sided. I was very happy to see that, that Joss Whedon doesn't make it that. But... Uh, I have no idea if there's a big $150 Michael K. Vaughn-style hardcover omnibus of all these. I can't imagine there wouldn't be. This is a perfect match of author and artist, so I can't imagine that that doesn't exist. I'm sure that it does. Uh, but I have these, and I was very happy to revisit them. So now you know, not only that Joss Whedon's Astonishing X-Men is really a lot of fun, you'll really enjoy it, overwriting notwithstanding, you'll still enjoy it. Uh, not only do you know that, but now you also know that talking about comic books is not safe <laughs> anywhere in our little corner of BookTube. Michael K. Vaughn had an entire feature on his channel co-opted by me. Uh, to, as I just sort of elbowed my way in, Roy reads everything. Was peacefully reading Superman Family all by himself when I elbowed my way in here. David Miley, he might be reading other X-Men stuff. If he does, will I swoop in? I very well might. <laughs> But anyway, that's it for now. The Astonishing X-Men. How's that for a left turn? Uh, but I, I'll wrap this up for now. But I will see you soon. Thank you, Booktube.